Hello, everybody, and welcome to Real Shame. It's a bi-weekly show, bi-weekly meaning twice a week, at least twice a week. Sometimes you <laughs> might get some bonus content, so not every two weeks. Twice a week show, yes, where we talk about our list of movie blind spots or a list of shame, whatever you want to call it. My name is Andy. And I'm Adam. And this week, we are going to talk about, or on this episode, we are going to talk about 1998's Enemy of the State with Will Smith. That's a movie, a movie from my list. Yeah. I have never, I've avoided seeing it. All these years, uh, and honestly, it was purposeful that I avoided it, but I have seen it now. We Are we going to get it. into that? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about my reasons for avoiding it, but uh, we always like to start off every episode, or Monday's episode anyway, by talking about what we've been watching since the last time we shot an episode. So, Adam. What, what are we been watching? watching? So, um, last time we filmed this, I talked about watching season two of Ultra Carbon, and I finished that. And I felt like it finished pretty strong. Uh, the season, I felt like it didn't have as much meat to it as the first season did. But overall, I found it pretty enjoyable. And then um, we watched The Outsider, which is a show on HBO based off a Stephen King novel. Okay. I thought The Outsider was really good. Um, I thought it was really good. And it kind of filled that you know mystery, supernatural mystery show that I've been kind of wanting. Um, you know, there is some criticisms online you can find about The Outsider, but, you know, overall I found it enjoyable. It's not a perfect show, but it was really good. So I, it's been forever since I've read any Stephen King novel. Well, I say that I, I had not read any Stephen King novels for a long time, but I did read Dr. Sleep before you and I went and saw Dr. Sleep, but I never read The Outsider. I've also heard good things about it. Um, I was going to say, uh, every time I think about The Outsider, I think Pony Boy. Because I'm thinking of the, the outsiders. outsiders yeah. So when people are like, "Yeah, I've been watching the Outsider on Netflix," I'm like, "Did they remake the Outsider, like the young adult novel?" But now yeah. I know. Now, now I've been set. Is straight. that the one where they click, so. clicking the bottles together? No, that's uh, the Warriors. Oh, the Warriors. Okay, because yeah, it's yeah. like Warriors. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 Come out to play. Yeah. So Outsider, pretty <laughs> good. Um, you know, I think some of the criticisms I've read are valid, mostly in that there seems to be some threads in the show. Or some ideas that aren't fully flushed out. So that's kind of disappointing. And we don't know if there's going to be a season two or not. Um, I think the showrunner, everyone's still trying to figure out what that would look like. Gotcha. Um, started You on Netflix with Kirby. And that was a pretty good show. As in y Y-O-U. Y-O-U, yeah. Y-O-U, okay. And she kind of begrudgingly made me watch it. But overall, I enjoyed it. I do feel it's a little one note. So I feel like the show kind of does one thing for all the episodes, and I wish they would kind of vary it up a little bit, just in the tone and everything. It just felt very one note to me. Um, and then the last two things is we're going to talk later in the week, we're going to talk about Eagle Eye. So I decided to go watch um, DJ Caruso's first movie, or movie he did be- before Eagle Eye, which is Disturbia. Okay which I remember really liking. And that's kind of based on the same short story that the um, rear window was based on. So there were some criticisms, and I actually think there was a legal dispute about that, about where that kind of fell into and whether or not it was copying, you know, um, from rear window or not. Gotcha. But uh, I did like Disturbia a lot. I liked it, not to spoil Eagle Eye, I liked it a lot better than I remember. Like, than I liked Eagle Eye and better than I remember liking Eagle Eye. And then we, you kind of, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. I started watching The Mask of Zorro because that movie is awesome. And I think Martin Campbell is underrated as a director. Yeah. So that's a lot of what I've been watching. Again, trying to play catch up. Andy, what have you been watching? Uh, I don't think I've watched as much as you, but, uh, for this time, um, I watched, so for some reason I watched a few movies that start with the letter M. So <laughs> today's episode is all about the letter M. Today's no, episode is brought to you by the letter M. At least the first M. few minutes. Um, I watched Messenger of Death, which is a eighties Charles Bronson movie. I love Charles Bronson, but I want to see Charles Bronson kicking some ass. I don't yeah. care how old he is. Like, it, you know, the Death Wish 5 or Death Wish 27, whatever it is. I don't care if he's, you know, 85. I want him to be kicking ass. <laughs> is and that it, part of the Death Wish series? It's it's, oh, it's not. not. Okay. He actually plays a kind of a mild-mannered reporter in it. But he does kick ass at one point, And it, it's completely unexplained, like, yeah. why he's such a badass fighter. But, uh, but he only does it, like, once or twice in the movie. So it's just not enough. 
uh, I would skip that movie. Watch the Death Wish movies, though. Yeah. They get progressively more terrible, but also more hilarious. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, So, but yeah, by the time you get to Death Wish, you know, 30 or whatever, I, I think there's only like five I've or never six, seen the Death Wish movies, but I imagine them be a lot like Remo Williams. Uh, but even worse. I mean, oh, really? Yeah, even okay, worse. Yeah. I mean, Remo Williams is, is fun. It's really stupid, but uh, it's fun. It's fun. It's, it's, it's fun. fun. It's yeah. fun. I mean, Death Wish, uh, the first one, anyway, you take it a lot more, or it's a lot more serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but they just get progressively more cartoonish as he and goes along. Bruce Willis did a remake of the Death Wish. Yes, right? directed by Eli Roth, and it's it's awful. Is there? It's not. It's. I mean, the first one is not great with yeah. uh, with Charles Bronson, but the uh, the remake is really bad. I don't think Eli Roth has done anything good, Cabin except Fever? for Cabin Fever. Yeah. Except for his first film, uh, I think everything he's done after that has been poor, or at least that I've seen. And I didn't see the Green Inferno or whatever. Yeah, it was. I've seen the Hostel movies. I've seen Cabin yeah, Fever. And the Hostel movies are. They were, it's one, I think it was one of those movies that were interesting for its time because it was new and shocking and just different. Yeah. But I don't think it kind of held up well. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, once the shock wears off, then you're kind of like, you're not left with a whole lot, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, agree. Uh, and then the other, the other movies I want to mention, I watched Miracle Mile, uh, because we watched, you know, some virus movies and then yeah. also kind of people that are, you know, hunkered down now that we're kind of staying more indoors are watching movies that deal with, uh, you know, apocalypse or whatever. I mean, not to be a doomsayer or anything like that, but I watched Miracle Mile, which deals with nuclear missiles being fired at the okay. United States. And Anthony Edwards answers a payphone, and a guy basically tells him there's missiles headed towards the United States, and it's going to be like an hour to yeah. to live, basically. So what he does, and he's in the Miracle Mile section of Los Angeles, which is why it's called Miracle Mile. But he basically is trying to get the woman that he loves who only he only met that day. <laughs> he's trying to get the woman that he loves out of Los Angeles. Interesting. It's unfortunately I like the premise. I think yeah. that sounds like a cool idea, but I don't think that they executed it all that well. Apparently it was supposed to be it was the original idea for Boarding? the Twilight Zone movie. Oh, okay. Uh orig- so the originally the, the Twilight Zone movie that came out in 83 wasn't going to be an anthology. It was just going to be one story and it was going to be that story. But they ended up, uh, they, they didn't like the ending, so they passed on it, and they ended up doing the anthology, which has the four stories. But Miracle Mile, he refused to compromise on the ending, and it does have a, a fairly bleak ending. But uh, I would say it's worth checking out just, you know, because it's a curious idea. It's, yeah. a, it's an interesting idea, but I didn't think it was all that great overall. And then the final movie that I was going to mention was uh, Me and Earl and the Dying Girl. Did you ever see that? I did not. I heard really good things about it, and I have that movie, but it's on my to watch list. I thought it was fantastic. I yeah. thought it was really, really good. Um, that that's a over the last few years, we've had a handful of teen or young adult kind mm-hmm. of movies that have stood out. I think Eighth Grade is a good one. Yep. Lady Bird is definitely worth watching. The two best films though that I've seen teen wise. Yeah. Is uh, is Edge of Seventeen with Haley Steinfeld, which and I want to watch. Great movie, and Me and Earl and the Dying Girl, and Me and Earl and the Dying Girl. I think you'll you'll probably dig it. It has a because the guys are kind of film buffs in the movie. Yeah. The the high school guys, the Greg is me, and Earl his his coworker or his best friend, but they don't refer to each other as best friends. They're coworkers because <laughs> they make movies together, and they're all parody kind of movies. But it has a lot of uh, it pays a lot of tribute to you know classic films, and they use music from the conversation in it, which is appropriate because Enemy of the State kind of has a conversation. And connection. we should talk about that when yeah. we get to the review, for right? Sure. Um, but uh, they use music from the conversation, and I, I want to say they do like a parody of the conversation, uh, something like that. So it's yeah. like a Be Kind Rewind. Yeah, basically they they've kind of sweeted or whatever they call oh, it, cool. it the, these movies or whatever. Like instead of Eyes Wide Shut, it's Eyes Wide Butt. So, really? I'd see that. I'd watch that. And no, it's not a porno. It's just a silly little movie that they make. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, instead of Midnight Cowboy, it's like the 2.48 p.m. Cowboy. Okay. It's like really stupid I, things, but it's fun. I think the director went on to direct some other things. Like, I think that was one of his first movies. I was trying to rack my brain and remember if I could remember who the director is, and I can't. I, and that's Ryan either. Gosling in it, right? No. Ryan Gosling's not in it. It's got Olivia Cook. All right, then I have no idea. What and I'm I don't even know the lead guy. I don't know the Greg character or Earl. It's got Molly Shannon. She plays Olivia Cook's mom. And it's got Connie, what's her name? Connie Britton. Britton, Britton Connie yeah. Britton and Nick Offerman. Okay. Then yeah. I have no clue what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, not, not Ryan Gosling. <laughs> not sure. <laughs> I was thinking maybe I was thinking, well, I think Lars, you're thinking of Lars and the Real Girl. girl. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, what you're thinking that's of. That's yeah, that's yeah that's Lars and the Real Girl. Yeah. But anyway, that, yeah, so that, that's, that's cool. It's worth checking out. I, I think we should definitely do an episode on Edge of 17. 
Yeah. Um, because I'd like I'd like to watch that and I, maybe we do one for Lars and the me, Lars and the Real Girl. Me and Earl and the Dying Girl. Yeah. Me, me, Earl and me Lars and the Real Girl. Me, my name is Earl. My name Let's is Earl and Lars show. and the Real Girl. My name is Earl <laughs> with Jason Lee and Ethan <laughs> Supley. Okay. Speaking of which, <laughs> yes. Let's speaking get, of Jason Lee. So, um, let's. That was what we've been watching. So yes. let's move on to Enemy of the State. Let's do it. This phone was a GPS sat tracker. Pulses at 24 gigahertz. I don't know what that means. It's like a low jack, only two generations better than what the police have. And what does that mean? You speak English? Obviously not that well. You're kind of a jerk, aren't you? So, Enemy of the State is a movie that's directed by Tony Scott, and it came out in 1998. It's written by Dave Marconi. I almost wrote down macaroni, but it's Dave Marconi. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a spy, government spy thriller starring, uh, starring Will Smith and Gene Hackman and a whole bunch of other yeah, people. a ton of other people. And it's a movie that I've seen, but a movie that you haven't seen. So okay. let's. I'm curious what you thought about it, watching it some odd, 20 odd years later. Okay, so when I remember when it came out, I remember yeah. seeing the preview and thinking it looked terrible. Um, and... I don't think I consciously knew at the time that it was Tony Scott. Yeah, but, but I I'm reeks. not a, I'm not a big Tony Scott fan, uh, honestly. I, I think that the, the 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 talent in that family all went to Ridley. I don't <laughs> I don't think that Tony Scott um, is well. I don't want to say he's not talented, but I think Ridley far outshines him as far as the movies that Ridley Scott has made. I think so. I think Tony Scott. There's some things he shines in, and the first movie he did with well, the first Quentin Tarantino movie he did was really good. The true romance. True romance. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he got kind of obsessed with shooting things in different formats and all that kind of stuff, which you get, you know, Man oh, on Fire, oh. you get Deja Vu, you get oh. this movie. And I do, you know, and you know me, like anytime there's like, I feel like there's directing involved, it immediately takes me out of the movie. Yes. So all those spy shots where it looks like you're on Google Maps or you're on the overhead uh, spy satellites. Yeah. That kind of was annoying to me so i can yes. understand you know some people's uh, avoidance of you know tony scott's movies because he likes to do that kind of stuff yeah and i don't i don't i don't think by enemy of the state he had quite gotten to where he would wind up with that because i when i was watching enemy of the state the opening credit sequence is like that yeah, it's yeah, yeah, all yeah. over the place and yeah. like you said it looks like you're looking on google maps i mean i was thinking that opening sequence is what the entire movie of domino looks like yeah. I thought Domino is one of the worst movies I've ever seen, uh, honestly, what, with Kieran Knightley where she's the bounty hunter yeah. or whatever. I thought that was horrible. It was like somebody threw up on screen. Domino's, it had so many cuts. and Yeah, Domino's is a very over. ADD movie. Oh, God. He uses, like, hand crank cameras. The I think that and Man on Fire, the subtitles, like, change font and jump oh, around. I hated Man it's, on Fire, too. <laughs> it's it's It was a style he was going for. I mean, yeah. I think those were a little bit more successful for me. I can actually watch those. But I don't. I totally understand where you're coming from. Yeah. So, so when I saw the preview for Enemy of the State back in 1998, I was like, that doesn't look good. It, it just, it, for one thing, in the preview, it looked like Gene Hackman was going to be the John Boyega. He was going to be at 11 the whole time <laughs> because I remember the preview. He was yelling at Will oh, Smith. Oh, like on the rooftop. He was shouting. Or yeah. Well, I, I think it was. It showed the part where he's like, "Why you blew up a building?" He's like, yeah. "Yeah, because you made a phone call or <laughs> yeah, whatever." Yeah. I was like, "Oh God, I like Gene Hackman, but dial it down yeah, yeah, a little yeah. bit, buddy." It just didn't look good to me. It doesn't help that the movie that uh, Tony Scott had done right before Enemy of the State was The Fan with Wesley oh, Snipes and Robert yeah. De Niro. That's one of the worst films of the '90s, in my yeah. opinion. I thought it was god awful. I remember nothing about the fan. Last Boy Scout is a movie he did in the '90s. I thought that was awful. And that's with um, uh, we talked Bruce about Bruce Willis, Bruce Willis, and Willis yeah. Damon Wayans. Yeah, horrible. That film. movie, the Last Boy Scout, doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I, like, I don't. I, I don't narratively... really, really remember anything. <laughs> I've kind of blocked it out of my yeah. memory, but I remember when I saw it, I couldn't stand it. Now, to be fair, I do like uh, Beverly Hills Cop too. Yes. I do like Crimson Tide. I yes. do like True Romance. I think Crimson Tide is probably the best movie he's made. Yeah, so some of those movies I can stomach. Uh, I didn't see Deja Vu. You mentioned Deja Vu. Uh, I, I think I, I either didn't see it or I always get that confused with Out of Sight, or not Out yeah. of Sight, Out of Time or whatever. What's, yeah. the, what's the other one? Denzel Justin Washington. Timberlake. No, no, uh, no. Out of something. Well, there's a, there's a Denzel Washington that's out of out of time, out of something. I don't know. I think I get that in Deja Out Vu. of the Past with uh, Bryn Fraser? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, so I do I, have a deja vu story because I was watching it and Kirby's like, what the hell are you watching? And I'm like, deja vu. She's like, this movie's terrible. Is it, is it all over the place? Like I think hyperkinetic so. like all of his stuff is? Yeah, because like, have you seen Paycheck? 
the Ben Affleck movie? Long time ago, yeah. So kind of like the paycheck, there's a technology that lets you view into, I guess paycheck's into the future, and in um, Deja Vu, it's into the past. Okay. So he does that kind of weird camera showing different kind of film formats whenever they're trying to view into the past stuff. So you get that kind of jarringness to it because okay. of, you know, he's using it to explain that story. Gotcha. Uh, did you see, so taking a Pelham 123 and Unstoppable were, were his last two films. Those look terrible to me. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I never, like, I never I saw them either. I don't like traits. <laughs> I never saw them either. So, so basically, I, I, I just took a very long-winded way of saying yeah. that's kind of why I avoided Tony Scott's Enemy of the State. It just didn't look good to me. Yeah. Uh, I've never really had a desire to watch it over the years, but then when we were kind of making out our lists, that's one that immediately, actually a few of Will Smith's yeah. films, I do not hate Will Smith. I like Will Smith very much, but for some reason there's there's quite a few of his movies like Independence yeah. Day that I just have never seen. And the one that he made right after um, Enemy of State, Wild Wild West, I haven't seen that either. I know it's yeah, no. supposedly not good. No, it's not. But um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. But Will Smith... So he he had shed kind of the fresh fresh prince kind of moniker or whatever at this point, and he was on this meteoric rise. Yep. He had done Bad Boys, he had done Independence yep. Day, he yep. had done Men in Black. He released his Big Willie style album that had the getting jiggy with it and Miami. all that stuff. Miami or was that Will Two Thousand? Yeah, I, I think it may be uh, the Big Willie style album. But and then he does uh, Enemy of the State. So, I mean, he's on top of the world at this point. Still right? going up. Uh, but then right after this, he would do Wild Wild West. And then he would do Legend of Bagger Vance. And then he, but then he would do Ali, also with John Voight. And yeah. they were both actually Oscar nominated for for that movie. Neither one of them Have won. you seen Ali? I, I did a long time ago. Yeah. I, I thought it was decent. From yeah, it's been a while since I've seen Michael, it. Michael Mann. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so, Enemy of the State. I will say, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I enjoyed it. I I I, I was shocked. I, I tried to shed any bias or hatred that yeah. I have for Tony Scott over the years. I'm still not crazy about all the Dutch angles that yes. he used in the movie. Yes. I, I I'm, we're looking I'm, at you, Thor one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think it's quite as egregious as, as Thor one, uh, but he definitely does use the stuff and some of the cuts and some of the frenetic kind of yeah. stuff that he does still kind of irked me. But I felt like it was a fun movie yeah. and it's possible that once again, that this seems to be a recurring theme with us, these nineties movies, it's like you go back and watch them and suddenly you're seeing them through nostalgia yeah. glasses. And even though I've never seen it before, it still kind of evokes that yeah. time, you know, and yeah. it's, it's a very kind of primitive internet, you know, sort of deal. Uh, obviously it's pretty ridiculous. I not to jump to the next episode, but it's not quite as ridiculous <laughs> as Eagle Eye. But you've got these guys yeah. that can hack into anything, yeah, yeah, right? Yep. And, which is always really, really silly yeah. because we know that nobody can do that. I don't mm-hmm. care how good of a hacker you are. And I'm not a hacker, but I know yeah, enough yeah, yeah. to know that no hacker can just be like, oh, uh, let me just get that satellite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me get that. But I mean, you see this kind of thing all the time. You see it in Arrow, the TV show with Felicity's character. You see yeah. it in The Flash with Cisco's character. So you've always got to have those uber hackers that are able to do anything and you definitely have that in, in this and movie I, I have this love for hacking movies so like the net sneakers all that kind of stuff <laughs> hackers hackers i yeah. love hackers and since we're talking about hackers i love the way 90s hackers look like seth green had his you know his his yellow tinted yeah. glasses yep. he had his spiky hair yep. and I, I i could i was confused whether it was seth green or jamie kennedy in the movie before i started and it was a bonus Cause it's both of them. <laughs> yep. Yep. So you get both of them, which I feel like Seth Green was a hacker in um, the Italian job. Yes. Yes. I, yeah. I thought of that whenever I was watching. And it. then uh, I just feel like that's that's their roles they played in the nineties. Because yep. I I remember there being a hacker character in the first Mission Impossible movie, and I want to say it's one of them, but I don't think it is now that I say that. Yeah. But I, I just love it. that. I love that look of like those nineties hackers. You know, yeah. especially from the movie Hackers. Yes. So I was like. Oh yeah, I love yeah. this. So yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no. Speaking of the cat, the, <laughs> the, there. I don't think there was ever assembled a more '90s cast yeah. because you've got, like you said, Seth Green. You've got Jamie Kennedy. You've got Jack Black. You got Jack Black. You've got Scott Con, James Con's kid. I love yeah. with his helmet. Spiky. He had a racer head yeah. going on. Uh, you had Barry Barry Pepper. 
who yes, uh, it, which I I like I like Barry Pepper. I want to see yeah, more and I mean, of him. He, he still works. He was in Crawl, the alligator movie that we saw. He's the dad. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, he's, yeah. he's it's not like he's not working now. He's a solid actor. He's yeah, solid um, in this movie. Uh, Jason Lee, although Jason Lee doesn't last that long, and yep. then uh, I have. Because of autocorrect, I have Jake Bushy, <laughs> but it's Jake Busey, Gary Busey's yep. kid. I don't think I've seen Jake Busey in anything in a while, which is not necessarily yeah. a bad thing. Wasn't he in a TV show called like Shasta McNasty? Uh, no, that's that's a lookalike guy. Oh, oh, oh that's, yeah. uh, that's another guy. But yes, they yeah. look they look okay. similar. Yeah, they look similar. Because he was a, he was a Shasta <laughs> McNasty. <laughs> Very nice. What a title! Yeah, 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 yeah. what a title! Yeah. But the uh, '90s were 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 a wonderful time. Kids. They were well, I, I and I remember. I, I think this may have been early 2000s, but Jake Busey and Tom Katz with yes. the the fat kid from Stand I just, by Me. I just remember. I just remember. I want you to say three words. Jerry O'Connell. And he's yeah. like, he's like, I love you. She just like walks out. Yeah. So great stuff. And and of course, uh, Jake Busey's also in Starship Troopers. Oh, yeah. and uh, Tom Sizemore, even though apparently he's not credited. Neither yes. is Jason Robards, and neither is Philip Baker Hall. And I was calling, I kept on thinking Tom Sizemore is um, Michael Madsen. Those they two, are very they similar, get, yes. Yes, but it was Tom Sizemore, because I was looking yes. it up for Kirby. They are very similar. Watching. I can definitely see how you yeah. get those two confused. They play the same kind of roles. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Absolutely. So, and, so, like, now we know I liked it. Yes. So, what, I remember what, what really liking on? the movie when it came out. Not really liking the movie, but thinking it was better than average. Watching again, it was it was fun watching again. Yeah. It felt slow to me. There's times really? where I felt like it dragged, and I was just kind of waiting for it to go on and go forward, and um, yeah, and the, during the chase stuff at the end, I felt like that could have been probably shortened and wrapped up a little bit sooner. But overall, I you know it's an enjoyable movie. It's yeah. it's good. Yeah. Uh, just like I said, just felt like parts of it dragged. Um, in my notes, I wrote the camera work. It's over the top, it, it is. which is, you know, Tony Scott movie. Yeah. And then also it has the girl who played Skylar girl, the woman who played Skylar from Breaking Bad. Yep. And a gun and a gun. Yes. Very early role for her. Right. Yes. So she was Walter White's wife in, yep. in the Breaking Bad series, but you blink and you miss her basically because she's, she's barely in the Yeah. Movie. Cause she's John Voight's wife. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And if you enjoy John Voight as a villain. He plays a really good villainous character in The Rainmaker, which came yeah. out uh, maybe a year after this, I think. That's a Francis Ford Coppola movie with okay. Matt with Matt Damon. That's, that's, <laughs> that you have to say his name yeah. like that. Because that's a Team John America. Grisham novel. Yeah. Because Kirby and I went on like a big John Grisham kick and watched a bunch of the movies, like The Pelican Brief and The Client, and movies that were made from his novels. Yeah, Rainmaker is one of those that it was it was, it was was on HBO. Yep. Yeah every day or something back in the late nineties. So I saw it constantly and every seemed like every time it was on TV, I would sit down yeah. and watch it. It was just one of those guilty pleasures of mine. Not that it's a bad movie. I mean, yeah. I think it's good, but it's just, there was no real legitimate reason for me to just watch it repeatedly. But I, I did, I don't know. And I do think some of the technology in this movie as far fetched, but it's not as far fetched as we've seen with movies and this stuff. It no. still felt pretty grounded. And I remember when I first watched it back in 98 that I was really surprised by how realistic the movie felt. Because I feel like, you know, you have like hackers, <laughs> you know, on this end. And then you have like the net and sneakers kind of on this end, which are more realistic. And I felt like this one kind of fell into the more realism camp, even though you do have super uber hackers that well, can backdoor and everything. And I criticized that, but I did like that they balanced that out with they all they seem to always have a chopper yeah. overhead, you know, who's yeah. following them around. And plus there's guys on foot constantly following yeah. them around too. So they also have line of sight towards him. I wanted to mention so the the conversation kind of overlap with this film. Cuz we initially talked about watching the conversation with this, but yeah. there's another movie we have paired with the conversation since I haven't seen it. Yeah. So I threw out Eagle Eye, which I remember the the Eagle Eye having a different premise than it actually has. But I but I think they're very similar yeah, yeah, because exactly. the whole movie yeah. they're basically tracking yeah. somebody. It's yeah. just in the in the case of Eagle Eye, it's not really Seth Green. It's a, a AI, you yeah. know, which we'll get to. But spoilers. <laughs> the, but the conversation. Um, so he is not play. They, they say kind of Gene Hackman is his character in this film is maybe like a spiritual successor mm -hmm. to. The character he plays in conversation is named Harry Call. Yep. And Harry Call is nothing like the Gene Hackman <laughs> character in this. He's not nearly as uh, intense and, and explosive uh, about things. 
But I, I mean, I can see how they might kind of view it as that they do when John Voight or whoever is looking, they're like, who is this guy? They're trying mm-hmm. to find, find out who he is. They show basically a screenshot from the conversation. Okay, like a younger photo of him. Yeah, for, and they took that. it directly from the conversation in, in that. And in the conversation, he does have basically yeah. like an old kind of abandoned warehouse, abandoned building that he uses to do his stuff like he does in Enemy of the State. The scene where Will Smith is talking to Lisa Bonet and they all the guys have like directional mics and like people follow them around. That's pretty much directly lifted yeah. from the conversation. That's how the conversation, that movie kind of starts is you've got guys, they're trying to record this conversation using directional mics, mm-hmm. guys mm-hmm. over here, guys way up in this building, a guy's one guy's like pretending like he's a bum or whatever. Holding it up. Other, yeah. All, using all a microphone like the one we're yeah, using. So I, but I, I liked that. I felt like that's a nice like tribute because obviously I think that that's what they were going for. Yeah. So I, I enjoyed that aspect of it. And I like that realism. And again, you know, you have Lisa Monet, you have Regina King. Yeah. You have, um, Who's the guy that pretended to be Brill? It's Gabriel. Gabriel Byrne. Yeah. Gabriel Byrne. I mean, right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these guys you don't see them as much yeah, anymore. Just yeah. yeah. It it, it kind of again we're talking about nostalgia a little bit. It kind of makes me yearn to see movies with them in there because yeah. you know I think everyone puts forth a solid performance and it's just like man these guys can act these guys can carry the movie can you know I want to see more of them I I miss seeing them and stuff. Right. When I saw Gabriel Byrne in this, the first thing that popped in my mind was that he's. He's an end of days, right? With Schwarzenegger, have you seen that one? He's, a, yes. he's like the Satan or the Antichrist yeah, yeah, or something yeah. in End of Days, and that's a, that's a cheesy movie, but it's fun. So I was like, oh, I'd kind of like to watch that, you know. Peter Stormare is my favorite Antichrist or Devil. Oh yeah, from Constantine. Constantine yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's great. No, but I, I like I said, I enjoyed the film. Uh, I I did not feel like it was slow. Maybe it's just because I hadn't seen it before, but I felt like it moved pretty well, and it's I think a little over two hours, but I felt like it moved at a, a good enough pace. I mean, it, basically a lot of the movie is just them chasing Will Smith yeah. around. He finally meets up with Gene Hackman and then they kind of conspire to take down. I feel like, the like government the guys action stuff in the train yard kind of dragged on a little bit long. Well, I just thought it was so unrealistic. Yeah. Like just shoot the guys from the yeah. chopper. You know, it's like they just fly right next to him that they still somehow managed to outrun a yeah. chopper. And then them chasing him, through the hotel was a little long. I just felt like, you know, and maybe again, since I know this movie, it's hard, you know, knowing what's happening and knowing what's coming up. I just felt like those could be shortened a little bit. They just kind of dragged on a little too long for me. It just felt like, okay, I get it. I know what, okay. And it felt like, yes, this is doing the same thing again. It wasn't really elevating or moving to kind of a different level. It just felt like, all right, this is the same action, you know, same, we're hitting the same points. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I one other thing, uh, sort of a flaw or, or or something that I thought was not very realistic is Gene Hagman hates this guy, <laughs> right? I mean, when when he meets him, he's he tells him to fuck off and whatever else, you know. And he's mad because basically Will Smith gets Lisa Bonet's character sure. killed, yep, right? Yep. I mean, so it's like, and that was like his partner's daughter or whatever. Yep. So basically his goddaughter yeah, almost yeah, yeah, yeah. Or may have been his goddaughter. I feel like he would have been a lot, he would have stayed angry with yeah. Will Smith, but he does end up helping him. And then it's like at the end of the movie, they're best That's buds. Right, yeah. You know, he's like, and, and the he has, how he hacks legs. into the yeah, TV. Yeah. I have no idea. No, no, that, that was but, ridiculous. But yeah. And then suddenly he's like, Oh, I wish you were here. Like and, they're old buddies. Yeah. yeah like, that, no. that, that ending part where he's like <laughs> showing his legs and stuff just felt completely out of character. So strange. It was just so, so it was strange. so random. Like it was, it felt like it was almost a studio note to be like, all right, yeah. we got to add this, yeah. you know, sense of humor at the end. Yeah. It felt right. really weird. Well, it was it was it like a were they trying to be like Shawshank Redemption or something? <laughs> yeah. You know, because yeah. that that had come out at this point. So maybe they were like, oh, we want these guys to have this kind of friendship that Andy Dufresne and Morgan Freeman had or whatever. Sure. I don't know if they, but yeah, that was so silly. I was, was like, so what? Weird. How are they like best buds now? They got like a bromance going or something. <laughs> but when he first meets him, he's just he like kicks him out of the car yeah. and everything. He's He's, and also like how Gene Hackman, he doesn't look up, right? He, he, so the satellite yeah, yeah, can't yeah. see him. But then he goes into the gas station and he just basically poses for the camera in the gas I feel station. Like, I feel like I do, but I, it's interesting I mean, because the first part of that gas station scene, he's like always trying to avoid the camera and stuff like that. So I do feel like that might be like a story plot hole that they could have yeah. filled better. Well, he walks up to the counter and he's just basically like, 
hey, hey, cheese. You know, because they have the clearest possible yeah. photo they can have of yeah. this guy. But they mention when he's on the rooftop, they're like, oh, this guy's good. He doesn't look yeah. up. You know, he does. He, he knows the satellite will catch the picture of it, you know, or whatever. But then he goes into the gas station yeah. and he's just like, yeah. hey. Hey, take a picture of me. Here's my name. Here's my name tag. <laughs> <laughs> catch me. Yeah, so I thought that was pretty funny. But no, I enjoyed it. Um, it doesn't make me necessarily a fan of Tony Scott's all yeah. of a sudden. I, I mean, and again, looking through his, you know, I've, I've I think we left off a bunch because this is Top did. Gun I, on there. I, Top Gun, I, 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 I left Days that of off. Thunder one of his? Days of Thunder is one yeah. of his. So, honestly, when I was kind of going back and looking at the films that he's directed, I probably like about half of them. Yeah. So it's not, I, my saying I really hate Tony Scott is kind of unfair because clearly I don't if I like about half of his yeah. films. So I half hate him, I guess. It's yeah, and we kind of, we were going through a while back. I don't know if you remember this, but we were trying to mention his best movies and stuff like that. Yeah. So again, it's if you like that stylistic element of his directing, then you you'll probably like his movies, but you know, for me it kind of throws me off and I like stuff that are more straightforward like, you know, we mentioned earlier, I think, you know, Crimson was it Crimson Tide is probably Tide, yeah. the best. Yeah. And also has an amazing score. Yeah. Uh so uh, I, I think we're kind of wrapping up yep, here. Let's wrap I up. just wanted to say I, I found because I was kind of looking at Tony Scott's Wikipedia page just again to get a little more information. Owen Gleiberman of Entertainment Weekly, he was a critic for Entertainment Weekly. I felt like he perfectly sums up Tony Scott, and he writes, "quote The propulsive, at times borderline preposterous popcorn thriller storylines, the slice and dice editing." And the images that somehow managed to glow with grit, the fireball violence often glimpsed in smeary techno telephoto shots, the way he had of making actors seem volatile and dynamic, and at the same time lacking almost any subtext, both excited audiences about his work, but kept him locked outside the gates of critical respectability. I think that perfectly kind of summarizes, I mean, the way kind of the way his movies are shot, yeah, yeah. and also kind of says audiences eat it up and critics are like, yeah. So yeah. I, I think that's a, a very good assessment. I do too. Yeah, I just wanted to point that out. But anyway. All right, good job. Could have said it better it? myself. Who wrote it? Owen Gleiberman of Entertainment Owen Gleiberman. Good job, Owen. Yeah. Come on our podcast. Yes. <laughs> our show. <laughs> All right. So that was Enemy State. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I did. Um, and I enjoyed it too, uh, although it dragged a little bit for me. So next time we're gonna talk about Eagle Eye. And I Shia LaBeouf. Apologize in advance for making you watch that. <laughs> um so uh, thank you for tuning into our show. Shoot us an email, realshame at gmail.com. We'll answer questions in the following episode. So shoot your questions there. Follow us on Instagram, Real Shame, And subscribe and like and leave right. a comment. And we will see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>